Hey, this is Jamie from Stillmeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about 15 action systems that I think are better than action points or action checklists. So if you watch my videos, you might have heard me talk about how I don't love the concept of action points or action checklists. Um, this concept is where you have a game, and in the game it gives you a list, a little, usually a little reference card, a little reference card of a list of things that you can do on your turn and you have one or more action points to spend among them. Um, so you can maybe use two action points to take the same action twice, take two different actions, things like that. And it's on a reference card, and you have to reference that reference card. And sometimes if you know the game really well, you don't have to reference that reference card anymore. You're just playing the game. However, um, <laughs> the reason I generally don't like this is that it makes me feel, it, make, it reminds me that I'm playing a game instead of just allowing me to immerse myself into the user interface of the game, into the game experience itself. Um, and I'm gesturing as if there's a board on the table or a player mat. Usually, and the things I mentioned today, um, there are many action systems where the actions that you can choose are built into the user interface of the game itself instead of being a side thing that you need to look at before interacting with the interface of the game itself. So today I'm gonna give you an example. And well, one of the reasons I'm doing this video is I've, I've bemoaned this system for a long time, and yet I haven't created a video showing you all the amazing alternatives to action checklists, some of which are very similar to it, but integrate those, those action selection mechanisms into the game's user interface, the UI itself. And so today I'm gonna give you 15 examples of other ways that you can do this that I think are better than action points or action checklists. So the first example is a card cascade. Um, this is found in the game In the Hall of the Mountain King. So a card cascade, which I haven't seen many places, I, I've seen it here, maybe one other game, is where you select a card on your turn in, in, in the Hall of the Mountain King. You're generally doing one of two things. You are either placing a tile on the board or you are selecting a card, you're buying a card, and you are adding it to your card cascade. And when you do that, um, you get to activate the benefits on that card. You get to gain the benefits on that card and you get to gain the benefits of each card directly beneath it. So for example, if I have two cards in my bottom row and I put a card above them, I, I put that card above them, I gain the benefits on that card above them and then I get to cascade down and gain the benefits on each of the cards below that. And I believe it is, it can end up being a four, four row cascade. So near the end of the game, when you place a card at the top of that stack, you're activating that card and a ton of cards underneath it, and it feels really, really good to do that. So this card cascade mechanisms, mechanism, mechanism feels really, really good to have this uh, cascade of actions where at the beginning of the game, it starts off very simple. You're just activating one, but as you add to that, um, that pyramid, that card cascade, you can get a series of benefits, a series of actions all in one turn. The number two example I have, and that, actually I'm saying these in number, these aren't ranked, this is, these are just 15 different examples, is also a pyramid shape, and this is from Kemet. And I think this is a great example because it is, it looks very similar to action points and uh, an action checklist, and yet it's integrated into the user interface of the game. So on your player mat in Kemet, you have this little pyramid that shows different actions. And the key in Kemet is that on your turn, you can select two different actions but they can't be on the same level of the same pyramid. And so you have, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it's one action at the top, and then I think there's two in the second row, and then three in the bottom row. Something effectively like that. Um, and so the game is, it, it, as, as you hear me describe this, this is very similar to action points and action checklists, but that pyramid is built into your user interface. It's built into your player mat. And there's a little bit of gamification here. It's saying that um, you, you can't choose the two actions in the, in, the, in the middle row of the pyramid, you can't choose both of them. You have to choose, you could choose one of them and then one from a different section of the pyramid. Um, so it just adds a little bit of, uh, of gamification to this action points, action check, checklist system. And because it's integrated into the interface of the game, it feels more organic that way. It feels like you are still immersed in the game when you are choosing your actions for that turn. The third example are top and bottom pairings. Um, and two examples of this are my game Scythe and also the game Gloomhaven, which use this top-bottom pairing, pairing in very different ways. So in Scythe, you have a player mat. And that player mat has uh, a, a, a different set of, um, of top row actions. So you have a, a series of top row actions that are organized in different ways on different player mats. And then the bottom row actions uh, usually have a cost, they, or they always have a cost, um, and they result in a, a bigger benefit, and they're always in the same order on each player mat. 
Um, so this creates some asymmetry in the game where you have this top row actions asymmetrically paired with a bottom row. And on your turn, you are choosing one section of your player map and you're activating the top row action. Typically, you're activating the top row action, gaining that benefit. And then if you can afford the bottom row action, typically you're taking that benefit as well. Um, this system, I think, works really, really well. You're, you're looking at your player mat. You have all the options outlined on your player mat. Um, you can't typically choose the same section twice in a row. So if I choose the leftmost section of my player mat, I need to move my action token to one of the other three sections on my next turn. And the cool thing this does, I think, in terms of action selection, because again, this is essentially an action checklist, right? You have some top row actions, some bottom row actions. You're choosing uh, a pairing of those two. Um, but the difference is you can upgrade your actions in size. You can make the uh, the benefit of a top row action better. You can decrease the the uh, the cost of a bottom row action. There are also buildings that you can construct in the game. And when you move a building off your player mat, you've exposed a benefit there. And so the the upgrading of the actions, the improvement of the actions throughout the game is built into that user interface itself. It's built into the player mat. Uh, Gloomhaven also has a completely different system that also uses top and bottom row pairings where you have cards and you're playing a card for its top row benefit or the top half benefit and then you're playing another card for its bottom half benefit um and uh, cleverly i think for all these cards uh, the top row typically ha has to do with movement doesn't always have to do with that but by default if you want you can use just movement you can move your character up to two spaces by using the top of a card by default on the bottom half of the card you can uh, i believe do a two damage attack um, just a standard melee two damage attack. And so I like that there are unique elements built into the tops and bottoms of each card based on your character. But by default, in a pinch, you can always move, you can always attack. Those are built into the card interface itself. Instead of the game saying, hey, like if you don't want to use your top and bottom row, uh, bottom bottom half of the cards, look at this separate place. Remember that you can look at this separate place and do this separate default thing. It's all built into those cards itself, themselves. I think that's really clever. Next up, I have the Rondelle. Some examples of this are in Barrage and Praga Kaput Regni. Um, I played Barrage more recently, so I'll talk about that. So in Barrage, on your turn, you are choosing um, a tile, and you are placing that tile into your action Rondelle, and you're pushing the other tiles uh, over as you, as you do so. And you're activating, you're gaining the benefits on that tile that you place. Um, but by doing this, by choosing this action, by choosing this tile, it means two things. One, it means that you have put that tile in your rondelle and you can't choose it on your next turn or for a number of turns, really. So that it kind of represents that you'll be working on this, this benefit for a number of turns um, before getting that tile back, before you can choose that tile again. It also means that the game allows you to gain new tiles. You can gain new benefits. And those benefits are treated, or those tiles are treated the same way as the standard tiles that you begin the game with, where you can place them into your rondelle, and, uh, but they'll be in there for a while until you can get those benefits back out. So again, very similar to an action checklist where your actions are built into the tiles themselves, but there's this mechanism of the rondelle and deciding exactly when you want to enter those tiles in the rondelle because you won't get them back for a while. Praga Kaput Regni, I haven't played in a little while, but it does use a rondelle and it uses a shared rondelle for all players instead of a private rondelle just for you. Next up, I have Tapestry. So I didn't bring out the whole Tapestry game, but I have the new expansion here, the Fantasies and Futures expansion. In Tapestry, on your turn, on, on almost every turn, you are choosing an advancement track. So you're choosing one of the four advancement tracks built into the board, and you are advancing one space on that track, pay, paying the cost to advance, and gaining the benefit shown on that track. Um, that's the entire action selection system in the game, but it's built into these uh, into these advancement tracks. Um, so on your turn, you typically have one of four cho choices. Which track do you want to advance on? Uh, arts or arts is in the expansion science technology exploration or military which one do you want to advance on pay the cost gain the benefit and the benefits get better uh benefits are also more they're varied by track from track to track um and sometimes in tapestry if you want to you can take an income turn so if you if you generally if you don't have any resources left you'll take an income turn you'll collect a bunch of income and then you'll go back to taking advancement turns on your on your next turn so track advancement uh, I, I haven't, I think maybe the system is kind of in Mob Mombasa, it's a little bit different in Mombasa, but I really like this system. I like that it gives you a sense of progression as you're moving up these different tracks. It tells a story as you, you've moved way up the science track, but you've ignored technology in the game, things like that. Um, 
And it's even though it gives you a bunch of actions to look at, you have a you, total of uh, 48 different actions or 48 different benefits you can gain on these tracks. At any given time, you're only looking at the next benefit on each track. So you only have to really look at the next four benefits, um, which, which narrows down your decision space. Next up, we have Tableau Activation. I'll name another, another Stillmeyer game here, and then I don't think I'll mention Stillmeyer games for a while. But in, in, in our game Wingspan, uh, each player has a player mat, and on that player mat are listed the four actions in the game. Uh, you can play a bird, you can gain food, you can lay eggs, or you can gain new bird cards to your hand. So the actions are there. It's action checklist, right? Action checklist on your player mat. Um, however, Wingspan does a few cool things with this action selection system. One is that they're all built into a player mat, where you can place cards on that player mat. You're playing birds onto your player mat. And as you play birds, you are improving the, uh, it, you're improving the core benefit for that row. So even if a bird doesn't really do all that much, there are some birds that only give you points at the end of the game. That bird, still by playing that bird in a habitat, it improves the core benefit. So it maybe makes you better at laying eggs the next time you lay eggs or better at gaining cards the next time you gain cards. In addition to that, uh, many of the cards do have benefits. So you're improving that action for the rest of the game. And on top of that, you're using tokens to select those actions. And those tokens, um, at the end of each round, you're going to use one of those tokens to claim a goal. So you'll indicate how well you did on a certain goal for that round, which actually reduces the number of actions that you have for the next round. Not everybody likes this, but I think it's a good mechanism to have in Wingspan because by the end of the game, your returns are much longer and much more powerful than they are at the beginning of the game. Because at the beginning of the game, if you choose to gain bird cards, you're just gaining a bird card, and that's the end of your turn. But by the end of the game, if you've populated that bottom row of your player map with a ton of birds, then not only are you gaining a bunch of bird cards, but you're also activating a bunch of cards along the way and so your benefits your actions get more powerful so having a token to use um, to select an action and also to pair with the end of round goals um, i think is a, a really good system to have in wingspan Next up is worker placement. So worker placement, I think, is a great re replacement for an, uh, an action checklist or an action point system. The, to the workers themselves are the actions, but uh, you are creating this uh, shared um, experience, this shared, usually, uh, player interaction experience of worker placement, where you're placing a worker on a board to select the action. You're choosing a worker, a limited resource for yourself to choose an action. Some examples of this are Caverna. Raiders of the North Sea, and Sulkin. Um, I love worker placement. There's lots of worker placement games, um, but I think these are all three good examples. In Caverna, you have um, an expanding array of actions from turn to turn. So every every round in Caverna, you reveal a new action that's available to all players. In Caverna and Agricola, you also have the cool thing with worker placement where if, a, if an action isn't selected by any player, that action gets better for the following round. It continues to get better. In Raiders of the North Sea, you don't really ever have your own workers. Like you, you do have some workers on your player mat, but whenever you place a worker, you were also picking up another worker. I think that's a cool worker placement system. And in Sulkin, you're placing workers on these gears. You can see these gears. And on your turn, you're either placing any number of workers on those gears, or you are retrieving any number, any number of workers from those gears. And when you place, uh, you are not gaining any benefit. You're just paying a cost. Um, when you retrieve, when those dials have moved around, your benefits have gotten better. When you retrieve, that's when you gain the benefits from those workers that you placed on the dials. Lots of different worker placement systems, but I think this is, I would say, one of the easiest systems to implement instead of an action point or action checklist system, um, especially since by default it creates some player interaction because maybe you have limited spaces or you have some, you can bump workers back to other players if they're occupying a space that you want. Uh, next up, we have crew management, and I have some examples here that are very different from game to game. Crew management in Orleans, Orleans feels like a worker placement game, but really, you are not placing your workers in a shared interface with other player interface with other players. Rather, you are placing workers. You're pulling workers from a bag, worker tokens, and you're placing them on your private player mat to activate different actions. So it's your own crew of workers that you are using to activate. The, uh, the things on your player mat, and sometimes some additional buildings that you've added. This feels really good, and the added benefit here, even though there's less interaction than in a worker placement game, um, it means that it can be done simultaneously. Players in in um, in, in uh, Orleans can can select their can activate their crew and activate their actions using their crew simultaneously with other players. Um, Sleeping Gods is another example, and Sleeping Gods. Uh, you have a crew of, of, uh, of, uh, of characters. These player controls a crew of characters. And on your turn, you will activate one or more of those crew members. So you'll, you'll just activate them. They end up 
Uh, you end up exhausting that crew member, which means you have to unexhaust them later to gain that benefit back. But I like this idea that you have a, a, a growing crew of characters that you can activate on your turn. All your actions are shown on the crew itself, and as you gr put more people, gain more people into your crew, uh, you gain more actions that you can take, a greater variety, greater strength of actions. Also, in Obsession, Obsession has, uh, crew isn't the right word, what do they use in Obsession? Um, it's a, it's a, a staff. Your, your staff in Obsession on your estate, you are uh, using one of the staff members and it has a kind of a time as, as a resource system where you're using a staff member and then every turn, staff members that, uh, that you previously used move forward on a little mini track on your player mat until they get closer to becoming available again. So they're kind of busy doing that task for a while and then you get them back at a certain point. Um, so all these, there are lots of different systems, I think, for, for crew management where the actions themselves are um, either tokens, they're, they're meeples, they're, they're tokens or they're cards, and you're activating those specific actions associated with those characters, those crew members, those staff members um, on your turn. Hand management is another great action system that I think is better than action checklist or action, or action uh, points. Um, in Concordia and Aquatica, for example, very similar games where on your turn, all you're doing is selecting one card from your hand, reading the action on that card, and taking that action. The brilliant thing about this action system, in my opinion, is that pretty much all the rules of the game are on the cards themselves. The cards tell you exactly what you need to do with that card. You play that card, it leaves your hand, and uh, it's out of your hand for um, until you play a card that says retrieve all cards that you've played and retrieve them back to your hand. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that you can add new cards to your hand. A little bit like deck building, which I'll get to a little bit later here, but uh, you can add new cards to your hand and, and use those cards. In Expeditions, our newer, newest game at Stillmire Games, uh, you, it has a very similar system. You can play a card from hand, uh, play it uh, until you decide to take a refresh turn and refresh those cards back to your turn. Um, the one difference in Expeditions is the cards that you gain are don't immediately go to your hand. They actually go to your active row um, where they wait until you decide to refresh them back to your hand so you can use them. Um, because it's actually very easy to gain cards and expeditions. But yeah, that, this hand management system, I think, works really, really well. And there's no randomness behind it. You have full control over when you have a card in your hand and when you're ready to use a card for the action on that card. Card escalation is my next example in Arc Nova. Arc Nova has a wonderful card escalation system. So in Arc Nova, all of the actions in the game are listed on five cards. And those cards are in front of you on a player mat where the player mat is ordered one, two, three, four, five. And on your turn, you are selecting one of those cards and you are gaining the benefit on that card related to the number that it's currently associated with. So say I have a card that's related, that's right next to the four on my, on my card tableau at that time. Um, the, the strength of the card that I'm activating, the action that I'm activating is four. And then I take that card, I remove it from the card row, I put it down in the one slot and all the other cards slide over. So it gives you, uh, again, similar to hand management, all the actions in the game are listed on the cards themselves. They're, they're, they're there on the cards. However, the strength of the cards varies based on how often you're using them, when you're using them, and also the back of each of the cards has an upgraded ability. So at certain times in the game, you can upgrade those cards and make them better for the rest of the game. That feels really good too. So again, all the actions in the game are listed on the cards in the game, and there's a cool system with those cards. It's a, it, the cards are actually inter interacting with your with this this one two three four five row, um, and they can also get better. They can upgrade. They can get better. Um, action checklists typically don't give you a built-in way to make those actions better. Uh, we're back, uh, down to the the last five here. A Moncala system. Moncala systems are shown in Crusaders: Thy Will Be Done and Trahan. In both of those games, you are picking up a certain number of tokens from a slot on your own personal Mancala, and you're dropping off those tokens along the Mancala until you get to the last section of the Mancala, the, or not, not the last section, the last token, and the action that you activate is where that last token ends up. Um, that's the action that you gain, that you activate. And sometimes based on, in Trahan, depending on the exact token that ends up there, um, the action might be extra special, might be, give you a special bonus based on the token matching something else in that slot. This is a cool action selection system. It's a, it takes like a very simple game, Mancala, and it can incorporate it into a more complex game. Next up, we have simultaneous or shared selection. Um, some examples of this are like Ares Expedition or Roll for the Galaxy. In these games, 
all players are simultaneously choosing an action. So you're choosing, in Ares Expedition, you're choosing a card from your hand. Um, all players have the same action cards. You're choosing a card, you are revealing it at the same time, and then all players are gaining a benefit. Um, it depends on the game, but sometimes you, you if you've played the card, you gain uh, a really strong benefit, all other players gain a weaker benefit. Um, sometimes all players are gaining the same benefit. Sometimes if you are the only player to play a card, then you gain, uh, you, you gain a more powerful benefit. There are different variations on this uh, simultaneous shared selection system. But again, those actions on cards themselves, and there's an interaction with other, the other players. You have to kind of keep an eye on what they might play um, and what you really need to play on that turn. Um, and you actually care about what the other players are doing when, when they reveal those actions. And it also feels good. I, there's a game that I'm looking forward to playing called Earth that has not quite a simultaneous selection system here, but a, a shared system where you're choosing an action and you gain a powerful version of that action, and then all other players gain a weaker version of that action. So there's this built-in interaction system, and there's less downtime because all players are doing something uh, on every turn uh, in, in these games. Next up, we have action drafting. So action drafting, two examples of this. One is Citadels. In the game Citadels, you are literally drafting, you're, you're passing around a hand of cards. You're passing around the actions around, around the table. So I get to look at all the actions that I might be able to do on my, my turn. I choose one of them and I pass the rest of those actions to the next player. And then we'll activate those actions in order after the draft. I think that's really cool. In the Whatnot Cabinet, here's the, the Whatnot Cabinet here. The Whatnot Cabinet has a different form of draft. In the Whatnot Cabinet, See if I can find the uh, the action mat here. I don't know, can't find it. Where is the action mat? So in the whatnot cabinet, I'll find it in the rules maybe. Uh, there are a, here we go. It's a, it's a series of actions shown right here, and the actions get stronger. This is actually very similar to Citadels, but using um, a mat system here instead of cards. The actions get stronger really you have, you have more agency the later you go in turn order so you can go early in turn order and have less agency where here you're drawing a bunch of tiles and choosing one or you can go really late in the turn order and uh, have a lot of agency over the tile that you choose um, but by then the tiles that you actually want might not even be available this is a really really cool system and citadels does something similar where um, the the later actions might be more powerful but by then your character may have been dismissed they may have been killed so you may not even get to use that character i think that's a cool system that this idea of action drafting whether it's uh actually drafting cards or looking at a public tableau like here in the whatnot cabinet a game that i can't get back in the box uh two more deck building Deck building is a game, uh, different deck building games use action selection in different ways, but in general in deck building, on your hand, on your turn, you have a hand of cards um, and you are playing as many of those cards as you want for their benefits, for their benefits in the upper left and sometimes the benefit the cards have different benefits in the bottom of the card. So uh, the example I have here is Dune Imperium because this is actually a game that combines two action selection systems, combines worker placement with deck building, um, but it uses... A kind of a variation on the core um, deck building system. Uh, and Dune Imperium, it's every round that you are refreshing your hand instead of every turn. But uh, but basically the actions that you can choose from are shown by the cards that you've drawn into your hand. It's similar to the Concordia Aquatica system that I mentioned earlier, with the difference being that there is randomness in here in deck building games. You don't know exactly the cards that are coming into your hand. You can control the cards that go into your deck, but the cards that you draw each turn for your hand, you don't have control over, which can feel good because you're getting some fun Fun stuff, but can also sometimes feel a little bad if you aren't getting exactly what you want to take on your turn. It's difficult to design a deck building game as I have found myself. And last we have dice placement. Um, I didn't get the box out. I have dice thrown over on my shelf over here in Kingsburg, two different forms of dice placement. In dice thrown, you have a player mat and on your player mat, it shows you different configurations of dice. So you're kind of rolling dice up to three times, Yahtzee style in dice thrown. And when you're ready, when you, when you have the dice that you want, or hopefully you have the dice that you want, you'll choose one of those actions shown on your player map based on those dice. So you've rolled some dice, you have some agency over which dice you, you end up on, and then you'll choose one action based on those dice. The extra cool thing I think part about this system is that there are cards and dice thrown as well, and those cards can upgrade your player map. So you might have an action on your player map that says, okay, if you have a, 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 a straight, a, a one through four straight of dice, um, you get this benefit. But you can put a card there. You can 
put a card over on top of that um, that specific action to say from now on, when you have a small straight, you get a much better benefit. You, you have improved that benefit. So again, it's having the actions built into the interface of the game, whether it's the, the board or the player map, gives you an opportunity to upgrade those actions and make those actions better. In Kingsbury, Kingsbury uses a different worker placement or dice placement system. It's a little bit more like worker placement where you are, there are a bunch of characters on a board numbered one through 18, or maybe it's three through 18. And you were, yeah, I think it's one through 18. And you were choosing some of your dice, adding them together and placing them on one of the characters on the board to activate that character. And so it's a really neat decision space in Kingsburg because the most powerful actions are the ones that are the higher numbers, but they take more dice. You have to use a lot of dice to use those actions. Um, whereas if you use fewer dice, you can activate more actions. You can actually take more turns each round, but they are less power powerful actions. Um, but I, I, I like that system too. It's a really cool system in Kingsburg. Those are 15 systems that I think are better than action points and action checklists. As you can see with all these systems, the actions that you can choose from are integrated into the interface of the game itself. And even though there are um, parallels to action points, like workers, cards, these are the number of things that you can do on your turn. You can play a card or play multiple cards, or you can place a worker, or place multiple workers. Um, they are built, again, into the interface of the game, often creating interactions between players or interesting decision spaces for yourself based on which actions you improve, which actions you make better, make better, which actions you choose this turn mean, uh, the actions that you choose this turn means that you can't choose that action again on a future turn, things like that. So I hope these give you some ideas. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Uh, I know some people feel really strongly about action points and action che checklists. They like the flexibility those systems offer. I hear that. Feel free to talk about that in the comments. I respect your opinions. Uh, but also let me know in the comments which of these sy systems that you like the most or other systems that you think are better than action points and action checklists for giving players the choices of what they can do on their turn in games. Thanks for your thoughts. I look forward to the conversation in the comments below.